that now, so. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you are the living God who dwells within us, that works within us, that ministers to us, that loves us, and that you drew us out of the darkness so that we can walk in your light. Father, I pray that you could just continue to give us more light from your word and through your spirit today, in our walk with you, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, a few weeks ago, is this volume too loud? I'm kind of hearing a ringing. I don't know if it's okay. All right, so it's okay for you guys. Uh, Bill shared an exhortation out of 2 Corinthians 4.18 that says, uh, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on the unseen, for what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I have a funny mind. I take a look at this thing and it says, okay, I'm looking at what is unseen. What is he talking about? Um, it's not what happened in East Liverpool. I was preaching, we had a handful of people, and I had, uh, I'd been studying about the law and our relationship to it, that had been a uh, thing that I thought I had a hang of at that time. And as I started preaching, I could see people were looking at unseen things. They had this dead stare, and I thought, okay, that's not what it's talking about. In fact, I, at that day, I just said, okay, let's pray, we're done. <laughs> It was the shortest sermon on record. Uh, but that blank look was not what looking at the unseen is about. And so we're going we're gonna to take a look at this. And here's your homework assignment to read 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter from about, uh, or no, 2 Corinthians, the second chapter from verse 14 on down through the, the fifth chapter. We're not going to read it today. We're going to go through in a fast summary. And you say, well, wait, churches don't give homework. Well, you can't say that anymore. I just did. <laughs> because there is so much information in that section, but it wouldn't allow me to move on to the rest of it. Uh, this has been one of the hardest messages to put together because there's so much in trying to synthesize it to something that still communicates what's on my heart. And so I'm going to just kind of summarize through that long portion of Scripture. He talks about us being an, an aroma of the knowledge of Christ. To some we're the, the, the aroma of death, to some the aroma of life. But it's the aroma of the knowledge of him. That's a key phrase in there. Uh, it comes about through this new covenant, the covenant of the Spirit, which is a more glorious covenant than the Old Testament. And since this new way gives us such confidence, we can speak boldly, not like Moses, who had to put a veil over his face. Because uh, those people, the Jews, still had the veil on their heart, even when Moses is read in his time, in Paul's time. He said they still have the veil on their heart. They, they just don't get it. They can't see what was supposed to be communicated here. And it says that in Jesus, this veil is taken away. That's the only way. And then Paul says, we have unveiled faces. He's saying, we come before God unveiled, and we come before others unveiled. We have a boldness, and it says that we have unveiled faces and hearts, and we're looking into the mirror of God's word, and we're transformed into that very same image from one glory to another. It's a process. 
you don't read through, you read through the whole Bible and go, I got it all, I'm there. No, you're not. You're looking into this mirror and he's showing you different things and you're changing into that very image. And then it moves into the next chapter and starts talking about if it's veiled, it's veiled to those who perish in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that the light of the good news of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should not dawn on them. The light of the good news of the glory of Christ, the image of God. Then it goes on to say, it's God who said light will shine out of darkness and he has shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face or person of Jesus Christ. We have this. That's what the New Testament is about. And we have this treasure in these earthen vessels, it's this clay body of ours, that the exceeding greatness of the power might be of God and not from ourselves. There's some power involved. As you're reading through that context, you'll see we have this glorious new covenant, the ministry of the Spirit living inside of us. There's power in the Holy Spirit, but there's also power in Romans, the first chapter, verse 16, it says that there's power in the gospel for salvation. It's the same word dunamis there in Acts, or Romans 1.16. So I see it being a combined thing of the Holy Spirit and the gospel being this power within us that's not of ourselves. It's of God. And then he goes on to say, right after talking about this, having this uh, light of the knowledge of the glory of God shining inside him, he says, we're delivered to death so that the life of Jesus could be manifest in us. Death works in us, but it produces life in others. Just like the psalmist wrote, we believed and therefore we've spoken same way with us. We have believed. We've spoken knowing that he which raised up Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus. They had a grasp of one of the truths of the gospel. Doesn't matter what happens to this body of mine because Jesus is going to raise me up with him. And it says that's why we don't grow faint or weary Though our outward man is perishing, our inward man is renewed, there's something happening inside, these light afflictions are working for us an eternal weight of glory. For we're looking at the things that are not seen. Now it moves on from there. There's a chapter break, but it's not a break in the thought that Paul had. He says, if this earthly house is dissolved... said, I got a house in heaven. And he says, I'm waiting to be clothed upon with immortality, that this mortality would be swallowed up and immortality put on. And then he, he says, he who made us for this very thing is God, who also gave us the down payment of the Holy Spirit. So we've got the Spirit of God living inside of us, yearning to be with him, learning, yearning to be clothed with immortality. All of these are points that come out of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and we're going we're to get to that. Then it goes on from there, and it says, we're very confident, know that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. The Amplified has that, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, is we walk by faith, we regulate our lives and conduct ourselves by our conviction or belief respecting man's relationship to God and divine things with trust and holy fervor. Thus we walk, not by sight or appearance. Conduct our lives by our conviction or belief respecting man's relationship to God. Where does that come from? the good news of Jesus Christ, who gives the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. So all this comes back to the gospel. 
the good news of Jesus Christ. And we've gotten to know the knowledge of the glory of God through that. It's by faith in the word of God that we can see the unseen. Here's a couple examples. You can turn to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 13. Hopefully I will tie all this stuff together at the end. Normally I like to go one point at a time, laying a foundation, building up. I could not quite do that with what I have on my heart today. So I'm hoping to share the scriptures and some it tying together, but then put it all together at the end. This is from the Amplified, verse 13. These people all died, controlled and sustained by their faith, but not having received the tangible fulfillment of God's promises, only having seen it and greeted it from a great distance by faith. So they could see God's promises by faith, the unseen thing. It was there before them, they said, we see that, we believe that, we grab a hold of this thing. And all the while acknowledging and confessing that they were strangers and temporary residents and exiles on the earth. Now those people who talk as they did show plainly that they are in search of a fatherland, their own country. If they had been thinking with homesick remembrance of that country from which they were immigrants, they would have found constant opportunity to return to it. But the truth is they were yearning for and aspiring for a better country and more desirable country that is a heavenly one. And for that reason, God's not ashamed to be called their God. He's prepared a city for them. They saw these things from a distance. And it says that they weren't thinking about the country where they came from. For us, we came out of the world, out of darkness, into the light of Jesus Christ. We have constant opportunity to go back to the things that we got pulled out of. But if our eyes are continually set on the unseen, and again, I'm giving you the main point, it comes through the gospel of Christ, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really make that clear to you. Because it changes your life. Another example in Hebrews 11, verse 27, talk about Moses, motivated by faith, he left Egypt behind him being unawed and undismayed by the wrath of the king, for he never flinched but held staunchly to his purpose and endured steadfastly as one who gazed on him who is invisible. I've got my eyes fixed on him. But he couldn't see him Physically, he was looking at the unseen by faith. He had a hold of something that caused him to be able to disregard the king, not worry about that stuff, and just move on. In 2 Corinthians, Paul was saying, we're looking at those unseen things that, so what if there's some trivial afflictions that affect my body? Even if this body is dissolved, I got a new one. There was something that had such a hold on him that he could go through these afflictions and say it doesn't matter because there's a greater purpose and that Christ is being evident through my life as I die to myself. For those who are taking notes, Hebrews 1.3, Colossians 1.15, talk about Jesus being the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus is the one who reveals the Father to us. Jesus is the one who shows us the knowledge of God. In Colossians 1.15, it said, He is the exact likeness of the unseen God, the visible representation of the invisible. Again, he amplified. He's the firstborn of all creation. Turn to John 14. We'll take a look at this. And read it. I'm reading out of the New American Standard. I'm surprising all you guys that think I only use King James, huh? <laughs> Jesus said to him in verse 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. 
If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Now, don't you like it when Jesus gives you a clear statement saying, you know the Father and you've seen him. And then somebody comes up and goes, show us the Father. <laughs> These guys are just like us. Show us the Father. And Jesus says, have I been so long with you and yet you haven't come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. So Jesus is the revelation of the Father. We, we saw that in uh, 2 Corinthians there where it says through the gospel of the good news, he shined the light of the knowledge of the glory of God into our hearts through the face of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, verse 2, again reading from the Amplified. For my concern is that their hearts may be braced, comforted, cheered, and encouraged as they are knit together in love, that they may come to have all the abounding wealth and blessings of assured conviction of understanding and that they may become progressively more intimately acquainted with and may know more definitely and accurately and thoroughly that mystic secret of God, which is Christ, the anointed one. In him, all the treasures of divine wisdom, comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God, and all the riches of spiritual knowledge and enlightenment are stored up and lie hidden. That's a mouthful, but he says, in Christ, the abounding wealth and blessing of assured conviction of understanding, just knowing what you have in Christ, there's a wealth that comes to you, and it only comes through Jesus because in him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden. And so as we get to know him, something happens, and we become richer. Our eyes are able to see that unseen stuff. Because when I think of unseen stuff, I don't think of gold roads up there. Follow the yellow brick road. I, gold means nothing to me, even in this world here. It's a, it's a mineral. Why, do they, why does it have value? It doesn't to me. Other than the fact that just like we use money, it has a certain value. Diamonds. It's a piece of coal that got pressed real hard. Why do we value those things? I don't know. So when I think of heaven, I'm not thinking, of, oh, there's going to be all marble pillars and gold streets and pearls and agates. and Who cares? I want to see Jesus. I want to see what, he, what he's really like because I don't get to see all of that right now because my heart's being changed, my eyes are being opened. And I couldn't see him and live right now anyhow because of the splendor of his glory. But I can get to know him from his word and by his spirit He's taking away things that hinder me from seeing him and things that hinder me from being able to keep my eyes focused ahead instead of every once in a while looking back to the world I came from. Colossians 1.6 says, All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it's been doing among you since... The day you heard of it and understood God's grace in all its truth. So God's grace is revealed in this gospel. Now, if you're taking notes, you can stop for this section. I have some printouts on the 32 points that I'm going to read through real fast. <laughs> because this is a gospel. On these notes, there's one scripture, sometimes two scriptures, to just validate. You can take those things and you can 
end up studying like on the blood of Christ. There's one scripture. If you don't have a strong concordance or an NIV concordance, whatever. I looked in the Christian book distributors catalog while I was looking to order some stuff, and the Strong's is $12.99, but you can get online and get the eSword free. And there's people in the church, I'm not going to name them, that can help you get that if you don't comprehend it. If you have a computer at home, but I'm not putting them in that position where they will do that, but there are people here that can help you. I, I am not computer literate, uh, so don't look to me to help you there. But you can get... It's got references on it. It's got the strong. You, you can have the tools that you need to be able to study. So let's look at what this grace involves. The sins of the past had to be dealt with. The sin that reigned in our lives had to be dealt with. Forgiveness and redemption had to take place. There had to be a means to reconcile us to God. There had to be the means of us becoming righteous. The law had to be dealt with because it separated the Jews and the Gentiles. The law had to be dealt with because it was a temporary guardian for the Jews, his covenant people. The law had to be dealt with because it was a strength of sin. The law had to be dealt with because it could not make us perfect. The law had to be dealt with because it was a ministry of death. The law had to be dealt with because God's promise was through faith and not the law. God's plan was by grace through faith so we could all partake of it. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is based on faith and revealed to faith. We're justified by faith. We enter God's grace by repentance and faith. It had to be the grace of God. No effort, logic, works, or will of man could be involved. Death had to be dealt with because it was a consequence of sin. Jesus' death was accepted before God as our death. Through Jesus' death, he destroyed him that had the power of death. I'll tell you what. You read Colossians, the second chapter, starting in verse 13 or 14, and you see where he was, he took upon him and nailed those ordinances that were against us on that cross, and he triumphed over the enemy publicly. You look at that in a, in a clear light, and it's like, wow, this is something. If Christ died in our place, we need to consider ourselves as dead and live for him. He had to rise up from the dead. We've been bought with a price. We're his servants. We've been delivered out of darkness into the kingdom of light. The spirit of God had to bring new life to us. We need the spirit of God so we can understand his ways. The spirit of God's the one who writes his laws on our hearts. The Holy Spirit's the earnest of our inheritance. Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's through the Spirit, through walking in the Spirit, that we fulfill the righteousness of the law. Through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we receive power to be effectual witnesses. And Jesus provided healing for our hearts, minds, and bodies. Listen, sometimes when people get saved, they think, man, I got saved. I, you're a baby. Babies eat and make messes. It's just the beginning. All these things that are there are truths that you... I didn't understand all that stuff when I first got saved. I got enough faith to see that Jesus Christ is the only way I need to come through him to have life. The rest of it is us looking in the mirror and being changed into that glory one glory to another. This is the grace of God. All those, I'm not saying this is all inclusive. I probably missed some stuff in there. Now look in Titus, the second chapter, verse 11. I'm reading this out of the NIV. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, 
and godly lives in the heavenly age. In this present age. I was just looking to see if some of you were going, Wah. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what's good. Now it says the grace of God teaches. So what do you have this thing from heaven called grace? Oh, what, what, there's that uh, commercial about the phone that talks back to you. Uh, is it? Syria or so, Siri, uh, find me a recipe for this. Well, it's not like you go, okay, Grace, teach me something. It doesn't do that. The grace of God is those 32 points and maybe more of the gospel that teach us about the knowledge of the glory of God. Those things teach us to deny ungodliness. When you find out that you've been forgiven, that your old man is crucified, that you're dead with him, that you're raised up with him so that you could live this life, as all those truths begin to gel in your heart and your mind, as you begin to see them in a greater capacity, that's grace teaching you how to live a godly, upright life because it's the Spirit of God working within you along with those truths. Buddha, Confucius, all the, the people that have tried to step up and have their own religion say, well, I'm the answer. They do not have the answer because none of them have paid for the sin's past. None of them have paid for the sin's future. None of them have dealt with the sinful nature of man. None of them have obtained righteousness, met all the, the needs that arise because of sin in our lives. Equity, righteousness. One man did it. One man met every single thing requirement that was in the world in order for us to be right with God. That's that gospel. It's the grace that teaches us. And as it teaches us, it, we begin to focus a lot clearer on the unseen things. Now, this is a word of encouragement. All those things just dovetail together. They work together. So God wanted to give you a little more confidence that he's the one that did it. How many have played the telephone game? Go around the room, within five minutes, the story is so distorted. So God said, I'm going to show you it's me. Putting all of these truths together, I'm going to take 1,600 years, three different continents, 40 different authors, including kings, a fisherman, a Pharisee and scholar, a tax collector, a physician, a prime minister, a military general, a statesman, political leader, a prophet, priest, poet, a king's cupbearer, a teacher, and a shepherd. I like the shepherd one. Amos says, I wasn't a prophet. I was the son of a prophet. I was a herdsman gathering sycamore fruit, and the Spirit of God said, go prophesy to Israel. I like that. <laughs> because that's us. God chose a <laughs> an eclectic group of 40 different people over a 1,600-year period on three different continents under various circumstances and conditions. They were written from, uh, Paul wrote from Rome as a prisoner from Rome. Luke wrote while traveling through Asia Minor and Greece. Moses while wandering the Sinai Desert. Uh, Daniel wrote from the courts of Babylon. Jeremiah wrote from a dungeon. 
Books were written during seasons of political turmoil and spiritual unrest, during times of peace and prosperity, during times of financial upheaval, during times of war and natural disasters. Do you know how hard it is to preserve stuff during wars and natural disasters? Oh. And on top of that, <laughs> the Bible is a linguistic composite of three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, or Chaldean, and Greek. You can't make that stuff up. God said, okay, I've got all these truths that interweave together that show my son Jesus, and I've got it spread out so far, nobody could just do that by themselves. And he said, I put it together to show you that my word is true. Now we're going to take a look at the thing that hinders us. From this. Turn to Colossians 3. I gave you the good part first. I'm giving you the negative here. Now I'm going to give you the positive again at the end. In Colossians 3, verse 1. You've been raised to life with Christ. So set your heart, hearts on the things that are in heaven, where Christ sits on his throne at the right side of God. Keep your minds fixed on things there, not on things here on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Your real life is Christ, and when he appears, then you too will appear with him and share his glory. You must put to death, then, the earthly desires at work in you, such as sexual immorality, indecency, lust, evil passions, and greed. For greed's a form of idolatry. This is from today's English version. Because of such things, God's anger will come upon those who do not obey him. At one time, you yourselves used to live according to such desires when your life was dominated by them. But now you must get rid of all these things, anger, passion, hateful feelings. No insults or obscene talk must ever come from your lips. Do not lie to one another, for you have put off the old self with its habits and have put on the new self. This is a new being which God, its creator, is constantly renewing in his own image in order to bring you to a full knowledge of himself. But it says we got to die to ourselves. Can you put, keep the old man and put the new one on? Something's got to go. And what happens in our lives is sometimes there are things that our stronghold, sometimes a little stronger than others for people. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, I'm going to read from the Amplified. I don't think I've had one from the King James yet, have I? See? For the weapons of our warfare are not physical, weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, and we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, we have the weapons to fight against these strongholds. Paul was talking about, as they ministered, that people would have different reasonings on why they didn't need to... Uh, have Christ in their life. But it also works for us ourselves. As we read the Word of God, we have thoughts that, oh, that's kind of wacky. Uh, the disciples saw that in John, the sixth chapter. Jesus said, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Do you want to be a part of me? And a bunch of them said, you got to be kidding me. I'm out of here. This is weird. He turns to the disciples. He said, you going to go too? I said, where are we going to go? You've got the words of eternal life. That's a mentality that we have to have. As we see these things, there, there have been two things in my life that have preserved me. Basic foundations. And that thing was instilled in me as a young Christian. That Where am I going to go? Am I going to go back to the world and the things that I know wrecked my life? That type of thinking? Or 
if I don't understand God, to just hang in there with him because he's got the word of life. He will eventually show me as he's changing me from one glory to another. And we can have all kinds of strongholds, and they come from two different sources. One is from ourselves. How many remember the children of Israel when they spied out the land? They went in, they came back, and Moses said, okay, what's up? They said, that's a land that'll eat you up. It's filled with giants. We were like grasshoppers in, the, in our own eyes and in their sight, too. Joshua and Caleb said, that's not the way we see it. They saw something different. But these guys said, in our own hearts, we see ourselves as grasshoppers. We can't do this because they weren't looking at what Joshua and Caleb Joshua and Caleb saw the unseen. These guys were looking at themselves, the carnal man. Or you can have other people help you out. David getting ready, he says, I'll fight Goliath. And Saul says, okay, well, he, are you sure about this, buddy? You're just a young guy, and he's been a warrior ever since he was a young guy. Oh, maybe I shouldn't. David didn't say, I shouldn't. David said, he's a dead one. I'll take him. It doesn't matter. Because David saw the unseen. He wasn't looking at his own abilities. You can have strongholds. Proverbs says a brother offended uh, is harder to be won over than a strong city. You get offended and you don't deal with it biblically and you allow things to fester in your heart. Some people have had grudges for years. They've allowed those things to sit in their hearts. Their strongholds end up being bitter. You could have been taught that the love of money is the, the thing that you need, you need to have money, money, money. Well, Scripture says the love of money is the root of all evil. But you can have such a thing in your life that you're always looking to just make the buck. You, you can't see the, the picture until Christ renews your mind. You can have all kinds of strongholds. You can read Romans, the sixth chapter, where it says, sin does not control you anymore because you've been made new, and your mind says... When pigs fly. You know what? That thought coming out of there is from a stronghold of reasoning. Because the word of God says you can be free. Now I'm going to share a personal testimony of stronghold. How many here know I hated to have my picture taken? I hated it, vehemently, obnoxiously. I wouldn't go to certain things at school. I got an award for one thing. I didn't go because I knew there would be pictures afterward. That's just me. You say, well, that's silly. Well, there are some other things and I've been researching all those 32 points for more than 15 years. It goes way back. I shared before, I believe, here, might have been Bible school, where God gave me revelation of how the law and grace and all this stuff tied in. And he gave it where it went in one ear, hit my brain, went out the other side, and I couldn't write anything down fast enough. All he was doing was showing me it does fit together. And it gave me hope. And it made me seek out the word of God. But during the midst of this, that stupid picture thing, it wasn't just that. But here, not too long ago, a few months ago, I've been teaching the book of Romans because that's one of the fruits that came out of my... Uh, studies, Lord said, you know why you hate to have your picture taken? I said, no, why? 
And he brought me back to when I was 13. When I was 13, I started sniffing glue and drinking until I was 19 when I got saved. I was addicted to sniffing glue for six years, glue and other hallucinogens. I remember laying on my bed and looking in the mirror and going, you are the black sheep of the family. You are the black sheep of the family. And you know what? Every failure I had in my life somehow went back to that root. And I wondered why it was so hard for me to deal with failure. I failed in many different areas. But the last one came 15 years ago. I stepped down from pastoring here because my daughter took a walk on the wild side. Thankfully, two years later, she gave her heart back to the Lord. But at that time, I'd already failed, felt I had failed God in not sticking with something. Now, as a failure as a parent, every, all my hopes and things I had seen, my daughter never had the terrible two. She, she wanted to be a missionary. I started smoking again. And for 15 years, until just a few months ago, I've struggled with that. Only a couple people knew it. And when God showed me that stronghold of me looking in the mirror and saying, you are the black sheep of the family, he said, that's tied into it too. I had fasted. You, you can say, well, Ray, why don't you just go to uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, they could have narrowed that thing down to you. They could have narrowed that down and maybe pinpointed the cause. But God used that for good because it drove me to look at Romans and say, God, you said that sin will not dominate me. What is happening here? And I had to take a look at my word and my life and the word of God. And all I could come up with You've got the words of eternal life. I am wrong, but I don't know how to change this thing. And I'm going to keep seeking you about it. I didn't throw in the towel. And he brought fruit out of it. And so at the end here, when he said, that's tied into it, I said, okay, I'm fasting one more time, because fasting is not a cure-all. To me, what it does is it shuts down my soul. It says, soul, just shut up. We're going to listen to God. Poof, it was done. There's no struggle. There wasn't any of that stuff that I'd tried over the years. Now listen. The thing that brought me out of it was grasping a hold without really knowing about it. I was looking at what is this grace of God. And those things that went through my ear and out the other side over that, well, longer than a 15-year period, they tied together. Those 32 points. I'm not saying I've got every aspect of them down. But now I see how they fit, what they do, and how it changes your life. And it keeps you looking at the unseen because there's a tenderness that comes in. You're not just learning knowledge, you're learning about him. You're learning how much he loves you when you're a failure. You're learning how strong he can make you in your weakest of times. You get to know him. And that's why now I love songs that talk about I'm in your presence. I can see the fullness of your grace. Why? Because things that had never ever been really clear in my heart got cleared up with one stronghold being removed. You say, well, gee, I don't know if I have strongholds. I don't know if you do either, other than the fact 
that when we have things in our hearts and minds, when the Word of God says, this is a possibility for you, and we go, yeah, right. You got a problem. There's a problem. We're looking at it through a carnal view. I shared that because the Lord told me to. So if he told me to, perhaps it's to help somebody else that struggled with a long time stronghold. God is so good that he's given us the weapons of our warfare. They're not carnal. They're mighty through God. And it's that shining of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that comes through Jesus Christ that causes us to keep seeing the unseen. I see it clearer now than I have ever before. My heart is in such a tender place before him because of learning to know him in a clearer way. It's not just learning doctrine. Doctrine's part of it, but it's learning to know him. So I'd like to close, and uh, I'd like to say, if there's anybody that wants prayer, to come on up, we'll pray for you. I'm not going to pray that everything just disappears. I'm going to pray that God opens the eyes of your understanding so that you can build upon him and his promises so that you can clear that thing up and have him established in your heart. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus that you would just cause us to continue just to look at what you've done, that we wouldn't just be satisfied saying, well, we're saved, but that we would take a deeper look at the total work that you've done because it's that grace that teaches us to just lay aside sinfulness and ungodliness. It's what allows us to have hope. It's what allows us to have strength. It allows us to keep our eyes focused and not turning back to the world. Father, minister to our hearts here and for those who don't have a thing that they're struggling with, that they could have a greater comprehension and insight into your word where it would just drive them to hunger and thirst to know you more so that their lives can impact the lives of those around them. Just bless this time now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for hearing me. And it, Oh, there are notes here for those who uh, would like a copy of the 32 points and then there's a little brief uh, put in story form or word form just how God ties it all together. So thank you. God bless you and uh, you're dismissed. Anybody who wants prayer, come on up. We'll pray with you. Oh, bake sale going on in the other room after.